Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 703. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is November 23rd, 2021. Right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted where Kevin and George sit down in front of our computers and discuss the, the news of the day. Hopefully most of it's Anglican, sometimes not, so we try and include most of the Christian news and sometimes there's not enough Christian news, and then we move on to secular news. So sometimes you get a little variety of everything. George, how you been doing this week? I've been doing wonderfully. We've just finished painting the outside of the church. Spent $20,000 and... Uh, uh, week and actually we finally broke down and paid professional contractors to do it and didn't have the men's group do it <laughs> so it looks great i'm really pleased uh the bishop's coming and uh soon in december and we want to spruce up the church and also the vestry decided we'd rather spend the money now because we had it in hand because if we wait we don't have no clue what inflation will do to the cost because paint is one of those things that's running in short supply and, and money as well i mean that's the reality we, we, this we've seen like 6.2 five percent uptake in inflation that means across the board according to the, the u.s government everything is costing a minimum of six percent uh gas more than that food supplies roast beef at the deli is even more expensive um and we were having our investor meeting last night and we we're discussing raises and I wanted to make uh, the point, are, are we intending to give our staff a raise? Oh, yeah, they did a wonderful job this year. Of course, we're going to give them a raise. They, you know, everyone performed flawlessly. It's still COVID times. The church is still growing. We have new programs. We have a new priest, uh, associate priest at our church. So we have more staff. I said, if the economy is now 6% more expensive, we need to, at a minimum, raise their wage is 6%, and if you want to give them a raise, it's above the 6%. And most of the vestry was on board with that. They understood that uh, um, we're giving out 7% raises and not 6% raises, and uh, you know it's not the clergy's fault and the staff's fault that things cost so much. So, um, But that's the difficulty now of living in an inflationary economy, George. You have to worry about how you're going to pay your clergy. Now, I, I think the Episcopal Church pays a little differently. You have a yeah. you have a little spreadsheet, uh, graph, X, Ys, and you, you can point to what your wage is. Yeah, we have uh, a uh, chart. One line is the size of the congregation in terms of Sunday attendance. And the other, ch the other line is the number of years of since ordination. And my church, uh, my attendance has gone from 277 uh, down to maybe 125 over in 2021 because of COVID. And that almost would give me a 30% pay cut. Well, the vestry discussed this and uh, they said, well, we're not going to do that because we might lose him. And I would basically be very upset if I lost a third because I've actually been working harder during COVID. So they're going to freeze my salary um, and hopefully it'll be back up. We'll be back up in time but uh i'm incentivized to have people in the pews so if i think i'm start going to uh get non-player characters and then introduce them into <laughs> the sunday services <laughs> little sim creatures in the back rows that i can count as people in church on sunday you know bob over there he seems so so cardboardish well it might be <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy so there are ways where i i'm not that I'm, I'm clever i can figure this one out oh man stadium crowds cardboard cutouts <laughs> oh, that's crazy all right so lots of news out there um we have a good we have a funny story okay um and i thought we we're gonna i'm gonna play a, a little clip um after we talk about the story just because you have to know we're not making it up like you, you have to know, but the Bishop of York, in his uh, um, all his glory, has decided to put out a uh, a poem, uh, a sonnet, so to speak, about C O P twenty six. Well, it's not really a sonnet. 
according to the rules of uh, poetry. And uh, okay, hold on. It's not entertaining according to the rules of poetry. But go on, go on. <laughs> it doesn't rhyme. It doesn't really follow any meter. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have... Uh, well, it's a lovely compilation of cliches. I mean, spilt gotcha. milk, storms of climate, um, and then some rather unusual combinations of words. Uh, the, soon you won't remember resurrection, dying beams that coaxed, coaxed new bows to life, melt into the mulch of forest tracks. Okay, now, you know, it, if, I think he's going for the Rudyard Kipling uh, approach. <laughs> uh, but no, but it, some of us have relatives who are impossible to embarrass. My brother Andy is one of these people. <laughs> Starting off at the wedding toast at my wedding some 38 years ago to the future, Andy is impossible to embarrass. Archbishop Stephen Cottrell is impossible to embarrass. He has written a poem that any silly 13 year old girl would be proud of full of or boy or boy well <laughs> i'd worry about a boy who put out a poem like this full of his his intentions were good it's just i think he should stay in poetry uh, stay out of poetry and allow uh we've been complimentary about some stuff he's written uh publicly in the past He's written some stuff that were very in target about the Church of England, and he's written some stuff that were, you you just had an audience of hundreds of thousands of, to a public uh, reading of your material, and you talked about your favorite episode or something. So, you know, it's there's good and bad. I would categorize this as, and I'm being very judgmental here, not his best material, George. Well, let's 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 take the climax of the poem enough sort of has that Rudyard Kipling if yes. uh, poetry uh, yeah, title, but getting late to conjure a correction, crying over spilt milk is now rife, and on the counters a thousand cracks. Enough is enough. Hope is all. Enough, rise up. Do not relax. I, what could one say, Kevin? Uh, I don't what could know. one say in the presence I, of such I, things? Not in since the inauguration of President Obama and that wonderful poet he had. Have Maya I heard Angelou, yes, yes, yes. Have of I course. heard something so cultured? Uh, boy. Well, okay, that's a good news story for the day. I will, you, you, here, watch the clip. Enough. Soon you won't remember resurrection. Dying beams that coaxed new boughs to life melt into the mulch of forest tracks. Which way to go? Nature's insurrection flying in the storms of climate strife. Strangle options, unable to turn back. Getting late to conjure a correction. I hope you enjoyed that clip. So let's go here and talk about some more good news. Um, real good news maybe good news we need to talk about it uh they have just announced that they're launching packer college uh in newfoundland and that's going to be a anic which is the anglican network in uh, uh canada's uh, acna version up there and it's interesting because i'm my first thought is do we have enough good teachers and deans and professors to staff something like that because uh, they already have Wycliffe okay. up there, I found and this on the web for good teachers and deals and professors. Check it out. <laughs> Thank you, Alexa. And uh, so you know, we we have wonderful. I always say, thanks, Alexa. You threw me off. Uh, Canada <laughs> Canada has wonderful institutions already. Uh, Wycliffe and Regent. Now this is going to be over New Finland, which is you know all the way over to the far east of the uh, the the great country of Canada. What is the point in doing this, George? This will be Anix Seminary. Mm -hmm. uh, David Short from St. John uh, used to be St. John Shaughnessy, mm -hmm. the biggest church in the Anglican Church of Canada, one of the major players uh, in Anix and in Anglicanism in Canada was tasked by Charlie Masters, the outgoing bishop, to look into having Anik have its own theological college. 
as you say, uh, there are some good schools. Uh, at this present time, none of Anik's seminarians go to Neshota House or Trinity Seminary. They go to some online programs, they go to some offered by non-traditional seminaries, they go to Wycliffe College in Toronto, they go to uh, Region College in Vancouver. And it was, and the study proposes having, because money was found, to set up a school in Newfoundland, in St. John's, the capital. And it's going to be called Packer College, after the late Professor J.I. Packer. Mm -hmm. his, his wife has given her blessing, his wife has given her blessing to this naming. And building ANIC as a freestanding institution I think is a good idea, but then in my way of thinking, is it now the right time? Because we're seeing a tremendous shakeout in theological institutions with more with seminarians closing left and right. Is now the time to start a new one? Or is the other hand saying, it's always time to start a good one and let <laughs> the bad ones fold? And, and th there's a good point because we've, we're seeing the really mushy... I don't want to say bad, but less than good Episcopal seminaries around the country closing or near closing or selling property to stay open or consolidating or sending their last remaining 12 students across the street to the other seminary. You, you see a lot of that happening in the, in the Episcopal church. Um, I don't see that at Trinity. Trinity is doing just fine. I, I, I know that the Reformed Episcopal Seminary in Philadelphia is doing just fine. Uh, offers many great programs, uh, and and I'm sorry if I'm not naming your seminary, but there are many seminaries here in America that offer Anglican tracts as well. You can go uh, to almost any well, portion of the country, have your bishop send you there, and they have an Anglican tract. Yeah, I can think of Beeson uh, Divinity School in, uh, in Alabama. I can think of... Uh, Oh, the one in Massachusetts just went out of my head. Oh, oh, that's a, oh yeah. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Our age is showing, George. Uh, I think there's. I think Asbury this one has an Anglican tract. I, I think there's one at Baylor and Baylor? Uh, maybe yeah. uh, Texas Christian University. But uh, the point is, is now the t is now the time to do this? Uh, is Anik with eighty five? 80, 85 congregations able to support a full, a residential theological college. Mm -hmm. um, and especially in this day and age of distance learning and things of that nature. But again, we come back to the point of quality always will rise to the top. In the current system, uh, in academia, academia is a awful place right now if you're in your 20s or 30s and you're a white heterosexual male and you want to go into academia, you're not going to get a job. So there are people who are very well qualified, very well educated, who have every talent whatsoever, but because of the affirmative action in academia, they're not going to get a, a, a job. And well, we so, the, so there is quality out there. So, I mean, you can staff this college, I think, with good people, but it's the money there because, you know, this is a long-term investment. You just can't turn it off and turn it on. No, I mean, it is long-term, but uh, David Short, he's the cream of the cream of the crop. Wonderful uh, Bible teacher. He was the Bible teacher for GAFCON 1. Um, we'll just have to see how this plays out. But in my mind's eye, as an entrepreneur, as a, a business person, you know, the the question is, is this going to work long term? I, I pray it does. Um, can we always use more seminaries? We can always use more priests. And if it takes more seminaries to make more priests, let's do it. So we'll have to see my, this play out. My, uh, again, that's my personal reflections. Um, mm -hmm. One of the difficulties I think ACNA seminaries have is they're trying to be all things to all people. They try to be Catholic and charismatic and evangelical. Mm -hmm. When the reality is, of my experience, is that they're really good at doing, they really should be good at doing what they do best, 
and allow the others to provide the, if you will, the Anglo-Catholic or the evangelical portion to it. And the Packer College is going to bill itself as providing tracks for evangelicals and Anglo-Catholics and charismatics. Unless you're a really big school that you have a critical mass in each of these categories, I don't think that's going to work. Um, and I, that kind of makes sense because the, the strong colleges here in America, Trinity for the Evangelical Charismatics and Neshota House for the Anglo-Catholics and Orthodox, you know, the, the, they both do what they do best. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a point to that. So what does he? Yeah, but that's a good news story. It's it's good to see that they have the resources. They're going to start that way, and but, if they if they have yeah David Short at the top, I'm I'm okay with that. Which and see see the thing. This is such a positive story because we're not talking about seminaries closing. Closing is the opposite. <laughs> it, we're do, talking about the opposite of we're talking about. This is so neat that they want to and they're doing this and they have the need for it and the market is there. Isn't that fantastic? And we're just sort of sniping around the edges, saying well. What if the money were put into Trinity or into Neshota House and so on and so forth? And yeah. that's that's a totally different conversation than the plight of theological education in America. I, okay, it's time to move on and talk about the, the topic of the uh, of the century, according to some uh, journalists and media outlets out there, and that's the, the verdict in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. Kyle Rittenhouse was found... Uh, not guilty by a uh, trial of his peers, a jury of his peers. And this is hard. This is hard, not because of the trial, not because of what happened, not because of self-defense. It's very hard because of the absolute dishonesty we find at the journalistic level here. And that makes the rest of this hard. If you're listening to MSNBC, Kyle Rittenhouse was found not guilty of murdering two black men on the streets of Kenosha, Wisconsin. You find that same thing from MSNBC and from CNN. That me, the media nowadays has so, or and journalism nowadays has so identified itself with left and right that they're just willing to, to lie and make up things or they're just not willing to correct their stories. Uh, Kyle Rittenhouse uh, shot three people in the riots of Kenosha last year. Uh, all three were uh, a Caucasian. Two of them died. The two that died were, were armed and uh, shown on video to be um, aggressing and pointing guns and knives at Kyle. He responded in what most uh, professors at law schools would say, a perfect example of self-defense it was on high definition fbi drone video you know this guy people pointed a gun at him and he shot back should kyle have been there that was enough for debate should kyle have had a gun not enough for debate should cut you know uh was kyle protecting himself that's up for debate is this an example of self-defense as understood in federal and state law Yes, clearly it was. And the jury you know, came to that same conclusion. And that is what we call the American justice system. It's blind by design. Uh, not every uh, result that comes out of uh, verdicts is fair. Do I think this is fair? It's really not up to debate. I think it's fair that Kyle Justice, Kyle Justice, Kyle Rittenhouse was able to seek justice from the justice system. And Kyle is happy with the verdict. A lot of people aren't. And I want to talk about this more in terms of the, the reaction of the church, uh, specifically the, the Episcopal Church. Uh, a couple of bishops have put out their, their very woke reactions. And why don't we just sit down and, and talk about those reactions rather than getting into the gun politics, rather than getting into um, the, the frivolousness outside of what really happened. Um, let's talk about this in, in terms of Christianity, George. Well, we've had three immediate Episcopal responses, uh, an order of unseriousness, if you will. The sure. most unserious, and I'm being silly here, Mark Andrus, the Bishop of California, which is San Francisco in the Bay Area, 
he and uh, the dean of uh, the cathedral in San Francisco put out a joint statement almost immediately after the verdict that repeated the, um, if you will, the MSNBC talking points. It was a political statement for all intents and purposes. Then the bishop of, of Milwaukee, Jeff Lee, he put out what I would call an ecumenical statement. Basically, let's pray for everybody involved. And he named, you know, all the different stakeholders in this case. And then he closed it off and pray for an end to gun violence. We sort of saying, you know, let's uh, let the villains here are the ones who with the guns, not recognizing that everybody had guns. <laughs> and then we had another bishop. Uh, I think it was uh, was it uh, Matthew Gunter? Yeah, I, I got Matthew Gunter's uh, uh, quote. He said, "Part of the scandal of Christianity is that self-defense is incongruent with the ways of Jesus." And this is where we, George and I, get to discuss uh, self-defense and whether we're supposed to be passive or whether we're supposed to just let things happen to us, or whether we have the right to defend ourselves, our family, our church, our property, and what that looks like. Now, this is an old discussion, George. I can think way back of just war theory. I can think way back to, you know, this type of discussion has been going on for thousands of years. Where, where do Christians have a right to defend themselves? And if you look at different parts of scriptures, you could make an argument for we must be passive in all circumstance. We must put her and put her just just walk into the fire and put your 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 hand over your eyes and it won't feel so bad. Um, we we all must be martyrs. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's true. But didn't Mary and Joseph take Jesus to Egypt to to flee? Isn't that self defense? You know, isn't that d defending one's body and property? And um, and I can I, I could pull up many more examples in the New Testament about self defense. So let's have this discussion. Does the, the, the I know the Old Testament does. Does Scripture allow for, uh, and especially the New Testament, a non passive response to uh, being attacked, George? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There's no, in my mind, there's no question on this point. Uh, as you mentioned, it's very easy to take isolated passages of Scripture and universalize them to all situations. Uh, we're specifically thinking here of Jesus saying, turn the other cheek. And, does that, and some people, Bishop Gunter now, taking this line, says that that is a commandment to have pacifism in all circumstances. The problem is that if you take that one passage and then place it against other sayings of Jesus, you find that they're in conflict. Now, does this mean that Jesus was inconsistent on this point, or does it mean that you don't understand what Jesus was saying? I'll give you an example. I mean, if here's an example: uh, Luke twelve thirty nine. Uh, but know this: the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come. He would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. If you're watching and not allowing your house to be broken into, what are you doing? You're engaging in the self-defense of property. Not even one's person or family, but property. No one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. We read in Mark. Jesus. Why? You know, Jesus is basically saying you can defend yourself. And here's and one I really thought was sort of almost apropos because it's almost out of the Kyle Rittenhouse playbook of what actually happened. When the strong man fully armed guards his courtyard, his property is undisturbed. Kyle Rittenhouse was guarding property at an auto dealer in his uh, town where he lived, where he worked. He was a lifeguard in that community. His parents are divorced. His father lives in Kenosha. His mother lives in across the border in Illinois, and he has homes in both places. He's a native. He did not cross state lines with a rifle, according, uh, even if you'll hear that. He did not shoot any minorities. There were no minorities uh, involved in the violence, except, well, one man kicked him in the head who was black. But the, the point is, is turning the other cheek mean that 
Jesus is wrong in these other things? Or does it mean that turning the other cheek means when someone insults you, don't respond back? Because if it's be, be passive in all situations, then Jesus fails his own test, because when he's smacked in the face by a member of the Sanhedrin, he responds, why did you do that? He wasn't meek and mild. So I, I think where I'm going with Matt Gunter's thing is that that's so, I don't want to say juvenile, uh, but it is. We it's a to, different, I would say it's a different understanding. Um, I would say it's the wrong understanding of certainly the New Testament, but that passive you know, voice has been, been part of Christian teaching for centuries. You know, yes, but it's, it's always been sort of a minority view that falls out from time to time. We had the Anabaptists and all this uh -huh. and that. And pacifism only works when you're dealing with people uh, who respect you. People mm -hmm. like to point to Mahatma Gandhi and his pacifism. Well, his enemy were the British, and they believed in fair play and rule of law. Pacifism does not work when your enemy was Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin, because they said, oh, fine, you're not going to go and kill you, fight back? We'll kill you. <laughs> there. See what that does. And the... Uh, See, how do we understand God's will and God's, God's, how do we have, where does revelation comes from? It comes from God's word, the Bible. And that's why you need to look at the entirety of his word and weigh and measure these things against one another and try to understand what scripture is telling you rather than just proof text stuff and pull it out and say, well, here's the final word, boom, that's it. Um, and when I mean juvenile, I don't mean childish. I mean, but not developed and sophisticated to understand the totality of what the gospel and the Bible is, what Jesus says on this point. No, and I mean, and that's what we're talking about. I mean, I, as a gun owner and a uh, certainly a person who believes in self-defense, I could uh, proof text and take out, you know, different texts within the New Testament and say, see, I can protect myself. Jesus in, in 22, 36 says, sell your cloak and buy a sword. Oh, I don't I don't just go down the street. I don't go and talk to my local gun shop. You know, this is supported in scripture. No, I'm just saying that uh, you, you can proof text all you want scripture. We as a whole can take scripture as a whole and say, yeah, there is a a the ability to justify self-defense in scripture old and new testament no we're not talking about the the age of gideon here <laughs> okay <laughs> we're talking about the 21st century in countries that offer uh, a, a basic amount of freedom like america and my problem is at the end of the day we're solely focused on a minority violence when there's majority violence happening all around us that we, we just don't see because our focus is off. The USA Today put out a poll, and not a poll, put out the results of a study released by the CDC that said in the last 365 days, 100,000 Americans have died of overdose. Okay, well, uh, less than 300 people have died from rifle violence versus 100,000 who died from overdose, where is the outrage there? Where? It's so misplaced. And we love to do that. And, you know, journalism loves to do that because it sells more. Uh, CNN, Fox News, you pick any variety of left-right news, they're there to sell news and sell clicks. And it, it's getting worse and worse, obviously, as you can tell. Um, I would be more offended that in COVID times and post COVID times, the people are taking their lives and overdosing than I would be offended by, uh, 300 rifle deaths in America, a hundred thousand that that's, that's half of, that's all of a call. Huh? I mean, if you think of, uh, Florida towns, you know, you, that's the a population of a mid-sized city here in America gone. Mm -hmm. And it's it's so destructive it certainly uh narcotic opi opioids methamphetamine addiction 
is not just an urban inner city problem, it's a rural problem. In these small towns that uh, have lost industry where the only thing left is Walmart and all the towns are gone, there's no real opportunity in jobs and, and the church has fallen down. It's not done its job to give people meaning and purpose and sort of helps them stand against the world. Young people turn to narcotics, methamphetamines uh, are popular around here because it's cheap. Yeah. Uh, uh, but you know the different one of the problems we have i believe with our narcotics laws that different types of narcotics are penalized differently and unfortunately those that are favored by minority communities crack cocaine are penalized more harshly than those uh favored by the uh uh white community meth you know it or marijuana for instance so that it's just we have inconsistency in our drug laws we haven't really thought these things through and we're standing by arguing about guns when there are hundreds a hundred thousand people dying of overdose yeah death. when i read that that type of headline you, my heart and my 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 soul my spirit just says we're doing it wrong mm -hmm. you know th this is where the the church should be you know it's most glorious in helping the people who are lonely because of COVID, uh, reaching out to those people who've lost their jobs because of COVID, who've lost family and friends and who've suffered the sickness of COVID. This is, the, this is an opportunity and a chance for the church to shine. And when I, I don't want to, say, want to say it's a failure of the church, I think it's just, it's a failure that we look at minor gun violence with every camera, uh, produced in uh, a Chinese warehouse in the last uh, uh, dozen years is is focused on that and not focused on the absolute bedlam and chaos of overdoses. Yes, I'm not talking about having a war on drugs. I'm taking talking about having a war on loneliness, a war on what causes overdoses, a war on just the hopelessness people are having in COVID and post-COVID times. Now. Let, let me be honest here. One of the first things I learned when I got to um, Florida Grand here is people told me where I could get drugs from what site they, they sell here. Okay. What? What? <laughs> These people are, the average age here is 75. And yet it, it is, it's become more and more enculturated. You know, uh, George and I have the same upbringing. None of my friends did drugs. I, I have never done marijuana, cocaine. Um, the only narcotic I took was when I had kidney stones. It's not part of my ethos. Drinking in college that was, was part that of my was, ethos. That was prescribed, though, Kevin. Yeah, that was prescribed. But uh, Okay, uh, Bud Light, uh, Old Milwaukee, uh, rum and coke. That was my college experience. Um, but here... Um, be, because of the overreaction to the war on drugs and stuff like that, I think there's just more of a permissiveness or uh, look the other way in us to drugs now. And especially in uh, this type of retirement community where people don't have a lot to do. It's part of their recreation. It's, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not part of mine. And I was offended and, and weirded out when I heard about this, but, you know, it, it's a different time, George. And it's, an, it's a destructive time. And mm -hmm. I think all of our viewers, if they don't see it, then I don't think they're, they're all the attention. way away. <laughs> well, what do we do? And yeah. I think the answer is so to be, before COVID, I was in the prisons all the time, not as a prisoner, but visit, we, we have parishioners who are in prison in the Florida system. And I'm involved in the Kairos prison ministry. And I'd be doing Kairos at the men's prison and visiting a former pers current parishioners of ours at the women's prison. And I would get to know other prisoners. And I found so many people. Well, I don't, well, I found an, I spoke to a number of people who cannot remember the crime they committed. They have no memory of it because they were high. They were, you know, doing something that they shouldn't have done and 
now they're in prison for five years or ten years or whatever. And the need for rehabilitation, medical treatment, now, there are many people who should stay in jail. There are a lot of people in prison that I've come across who have mental illnesses that are made so much worse by narcotics, or there are people who were brought into prison by their addictions and their bad habits. And I think these people need the saving message of Jesus Christ, that their life is worth something. It has value. One of the scary things for me is seeing these people, especially, it, well, it's more marked in the women's prison, these people who tattoo their faces completely. And there's such a degree of self, the, the one person who I've talked to at length about this, has such a degree of self-loathing that, you know, I am scum, so I might as well look like scum. And sharing the fact that God loves her that you know her life has meaning and purpose and she can be set free from the pain that she has that message just needs to be shared part of our part of the episcopal church's problem is we think that it's that's the priest's job i don't have to do it that's the priest who needs to evangelize and then half the priests are pretty crappy and they don't do the job either so what happens you have modern episcopal church well i think yeah well Modern church, I think, sees her as a victim and want to have her succeed in life by being the victim. We as a church need to see her as loved unconditionally by God, therefore loved unconditionally by us and served unconditionally by us. Kevin, it, it's, you, it, it, it's completely different than victimhood. Kevin, you just... Uh got a three-year education in seminary you're not ready to be a minister because you're exactly right it's seeing people as god sees them not as the horrid creature with the rap sheet and the tattoos and whatnot now when they're a danger to society and to themselves they need to be locked up mm -hmm. i'm not we're after all in florida where we like to lock up people I, okay um, and, and, well we have the great example in waukesha this this week of a person who killed five people with a car who has a rap sheet 30 years long clearly a, a career criminal who should have been locked up and kept locked up you no know, th there are people george who should be locked up and stay that way absolutely there are people who have severe mental illnesses where they can only act out in violence and have these types of syndromes absolutely we need to find a way to minister and show them unconditional love and keep them safe from themselves and keep us safe in that relationship as well. Absolutely. It, in my heart, all of these discussions that we've just had underlie the ma major premise, if you will, almost of my life and my ministry is the absence of Christ in the hearts of so many people and what it can do, what when he is present, what it can do to change things. Mm -hmm. And to have clergy mouth, I don't want to say mouth off because that's pejorative, but to have clergy devote the majority of their public utterances to oh, gun crime and mosquito nets and uh, all these issues that are current with the political class and miss the point about, you know, God and Jesus and start there. They're wasting their ministry. They're wasting their voices. Let the politicians, let the concerned lay people talk about gun crime. Mm -hmm. You, if you're a minister, talk about Jesus Christ and what he can do for you. Oh, wow. We nailed that topic. But, you know, I want to point out that you're not being served by media. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it, the Rittenhouse was a great example of the distortion put out by both the left and right uh kyle did an interview and said everybody got it wrong you know and, and he um it, it's interesting to watch the the real facts come out in the end when this is all over and the the dust has settled because now we kind of live in an age where all reports are first reports mm -hmm. when you're watching the kyle rittenhouse that everything is first reported and completely inaccurate and they never go back and, and correct the inaccuracies and george and i you know have great examples in the past of where first 
reports were wrong. Well, now every morning, people, journalists get up and they have this first report mentality. I have to deliver the breaking news, no matter how accurate or inaccurate. And inaccurate, I can be a little inaccurate, but it'll get more readership and I'll get more money. But now we're to the point where we're beyond distortion and we're beyond uh, having our journalist reproached. I can't correct a journalist story. Uh, CNN lied about uh, a black man dying in Kenosha. How do I get them to correct that and say, no, a black man did not die in Kenosha? They won't. They won't. And what do, you, what, what do we do, George? Well, we have to sit here and we have to, to speak the truth and, you know, provide our, our sources and stuff like that. But it, we also have to be in the mentality where, oh, I hate to say this, but we uh, have to love journalists unconditionally and forgive them as well. Once they ask forgiveness, I'll, I'll, yeah. Well, what we try to do, Kevin, in, yeah. say, in Anglican Inc. and other ventures we do, is just lay it all out there. Lay out and try to refrain from as much commentary, which we do here on this This is, this program. is the commentary, right. But I'm more likely at this stage, after doing this for 25 years, to put out two press releases that are diametrically opposed from the two sides of a party. Uh, the, the Episcopal court cases were wonderful for this because I could put out the Episcopal Church in South Carolina and the Episcopal Diocese of South Carolina or Fort Worth and Fort Worth and let you read both of them and let you as an informed adult say, okay, it's pretty clear who's lying through their teeth here. But because so much of the media now is, okay, I'm gonna tell you who's lying through their teeth because I believe that's my team, rather than letting you, an intelligent informed reader, put the facts together and come out to a conclusion yeah. that you feel is correct. The NCAAP is convinced that Kyle had killed somebody who was of a person of color. And they're convinced because they heard it from their media sources. And it, it's so hard to watch that. And then you see all these stars on Twitter, the Hollywood people, saying, you know, Kyle was allowed to kill a person of color. And I'm just like... We've gone beyond the usefulness of having media. Is that, is that the worst part of COVID? Is that the worst part of the 21st century? Has social media completely imploded? Has the internet completely screwed over our society? I don't know, George. I, I don't have an answer. I just well, one, <laughs> one thing I saw, or well, the Independent, if you're British and if you read the Independent, they uh, famously said that uh, Rittenhouse killed two black men. I, was, I uh, like to look at the world press. Uh, the uh, Some of the Arab press are saying that Rittenhouse took, killed two Jews <laughs> because his two victims were Jewish. And I uh, mean, just, we're not in the world of the ridiculous. I mean, each group, each around the world has got their uh, uh, preferred either victim and villain uh, already picked out. Well, and that's a is that uh, uh, make my point you know every time the Atlanta complains about the the Atlantic complains about the economy or slate magazine complains about uh, you know something that I believe in I'll, I'll post that story because they they right I remember slate wrote you know the, one of the better anti-abortion pieces uh, about 10 years ago and nobody could believe it uh, and I kept having to, to forward that link. It's, it's crazy. Um, the Sun recently did an the Sun, a liberal paper, did an article about Justin Welby's wokeness. You know um, that he he is too woke. <laughs> if, you, if if you can be too woke, and you know it, it, it's crazy what's really happening. You know, people, you, you know, you guys are being redundant. You keep saying everything's crazy. Oh, it is crazy. Now tell me about the Whoa. Sun, George. <laughs> Oh, the Sun is a red top, which is a tabloid. The tabloids in Britain are different from American tabloids. No, in the National Enquirer, nobody reads as a newspaper. It's entertainment. Mm -hmm. But the red tops, the tabloids in Britain, are read as journalism. They're just really crude journalism. And 
the sun is on the left on the left so to speak um of things they certainly are not uh, admirers of the establishment and they just but they just took Welby to task for really just well they've been watching anglican unscripted for too long i uh, think they just they well, probably and and here's the joke of it the same week peter hitchens in the telegraph and hitchens is very conservative mm -hmm. uh applauded justin welby the same week the sun denounced justin welby and he applauded justin welby for finally manning up and apologizing for the george bell situation yeah, we said the same thing okay maybe peter watches the program but thank you justin for finally apologizing for that you could do a lot more there's still gonna be a consequences for what you did to uh bishop george but we, we live in this reality now that existed before it's just made so much worse by social media by the polarization that's going on uh outside the church and sadly inside the church you know so, so well kevin i think part of this comes back to something earlier we discussed and how do you, what do you do in the situation like this do you go along to get along do you just allow yourself to be led by the nose one of the more controversial and popular among traditionalist circles is the Benedict option that is put out by Rob Dreher, which is in essence, you basically live in a society within a society. Mm -hmm. That your schooling, your social life, your media, uh, your be basically evolved around those of like-minded faith and uh, worldview. And in essence, you're retreating to the monastery while the barbarians are ravaging the countryside. And I feel like the barbarians certainly are ravaging the countryside. When you know, when we have Walnut Creek, uh, which is a lovely, beautiful suburb of uh, San Francisco, ravaged by looters, uh, the, the, the the violence is leaving the cities. It's moving into the very nice, well-heeled suburbs in California the barbarians are ravaging the countryside and for for christians the debate is do we stay in society and be leaven in the society and change from within or do we step out at this time and wait for the circle to turn and uh, preserve our families and our and our, our our way of thinking and believing until the bad times are over yeah and I'm going to give you an interesting observation from Kevin, who in the middle of COVID sold his house, bought an RV, and hit the road. And we were in this um, for decades uh, life where we went to our jobs, we went to our church, we hung with our friends, we raised our children, went to their events, and we weren't really meeting new people and uh, sharing our faith. COVID, I've bought an RV, I'm traveling the country, and I'm meeting people all the time now and sharing my life and faith like never before. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's odd. I, you know, okay, I share my faith when I play quarters poker here uh, with the guys at the RV park. People who've never really heard the gospel presented before or seen a, a, who had no um, experience of a person who's uh, evangelical or you know has made it to 55 and still believes in the resurrected transforming love of Jesus Christ <laughs> and so you know um, I, I, I can't explain was I not paying attention or wasn't eager enough to share my faith before I bought an RV and went out or is I'm just having different opportunities because I meet more new people. Don't know. Well, you don't need to know because the Holy yeah. Spirit is working within your life. We're seeing the fruits of that right now. I, I am more salted and more light litted, litted uh, now for some reason. Um, and uh, wow, God. Yeah, so, Can we uh, just touch on Melvin? just before yeah, we do. yeah let's let's finish up because he's you know a hero of the uh, of the faith certainly within the church of england outside the church of england um i have a signed copy of his book that i will treasure um melvin tinker announced in october uh 
not October 2020, October this year, that he was uh, suffering from pan pancreatic cancer. He was going to have it treated, and everybody was optimistic. He put out uh, a letter just a couple days ago that um, it has metastasized, it's everywhere, um, and it's time to gather the family. And I had read that yesterday, and today we learned that uh, um, uh, the great Melvin Tink Tinker has, has, um, has died, George. Uh, yeah, it's Andrew Symes of Anglican Mainstream, who's mm -hmm. a friend of Melvin's, uh, announced uh, the death. His, uh, Melvin's son has been keeping uh, people informed on Twitter about the father's situation, and he passed away uh, early in the morning of November 23rd. Uh, and in many ways, it's another tragedy for the evangelical movement in the Church of England, in the sense of uh, not a betrayal like the Jonathan Smythe, uh, John Smythe or Jonathan Fletcher, but it's, it's a tragedy akin to well, akin to Mike Manazarali, taking somebody off the field who had such a voice and such a such a positive influence and as a refining, redeeming uh, character within the life of the Church of England, and we're not he's now taken off the playing field mm -hmm. with death. So yeah. we would we pray for his peace for his children, his grandchildren, his wife. And uh, may others arise to take Melvin's place and fight the good fight, yeah. because it's a fight worth fighting, I believe. Yeah, we mourn Melvin's death. We uh, uh, await for more Melvins. Uh, the world needs many more Melvins, absolutely. And, and we are confident that we shall see him again mm. when the dead are raised and okay. Christ returns to the world. All right, so uh, scheduling. Uh, George and I are having Thanksgiving together. There will be no recording on Black Friday. Okay, so uh, please enjoy your time with your families. Uh, set your uh, calendars to next Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern time when I will upload 704 of Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 703 of Anglican unscripted.